Hello, my name is Cal Mollet from Richmond, Virginia, and I'm an anarchist. Hey, I'm Matt Badalioli, uh, an Austrian economics uh, free market anarchist and stuff. And today we're bringing to you the news from underground. Specifically, we're going to talk about the minimum wage and that uh, we're going to see a lot of uh, attempts by your local political rulers to uh, pull the wool over your eye, trying to distract you from the real reason why you're not making a livable wage and trying to say it's your employers, you know, it's the, uh, the businesses that are preventing you from having a, a fun and uh, profitable and enjoyable lifestyle, you know, to, to enjoy your life. And, you know, with all these hardships, trying to say that it's your employer's fault. Uh, but we're going to talk about that and so that the common denominator, of course, of all our suffering and impoverishment is the state. And so, of course, this is going to lead into the November election. So we're going to hear this constantly. Obama's talking about this all the time, $10 and 10 cents for a minimum wage. Um, so we're going to talk about it objectively. Uh, we're going to go through the, the history, what it does, the effects, some of the rebuttals and uh, what you can do. Uh, with this information. So we'll start first. You know the year when it started? In 1938, I believe. It started uh, as, a, as a kind of like a New Deal thing. Uh, I know it was uh, supported a whole lot by uh, the really uh, radical conservatives at the time as well who were trying to price black people out of the labor market. Right. And uh, and so, yeah, and so the history uh, from when it started, it's been uh, implemented uh, several times since. And uh, we're going to go into some of the data and showing that uh, it's never actually created the, I guess, the economic development or progress that it claims to. Quite the contrary. Yeah, <laughs> quite the contrary. It doesn't really create employment. Um, so, yeah, so what is uh, the minimum wage objectively? Uh, it would just be uh, basically a law that states that it is illegal for you to be hired by anyone uh, if your contract has you working uh, per hour less than $7.25. Right, so so it's illegal. It's criminal for me to hire. You know, if minimum wage says that it's uh, I have to hire for ten dollars. It's illegal and criminal for me to hire you for nine dollars and uh, fifty nine cents, right, or ninety nine cents, or anything below that. And of course, anytime you have a deal like that, it is a voluntary contract. Uh, it's a wage contract that is outlawed, and that's an outlawed job. You can never say that it's going to ever increase employment. Right. Right. Yeah. And we're going to go with the statistics and data for that to show sure. you. So, so that way you're never, uh, uh, I guess, with all these shenanigans politics out there, you know, you're better informed of all the lies that they, they peddle. Um, and again, it's all distractions, all bread and circuses. So yeah, minimum wage laws do not provide any jobs. Um, it only outlaws them. And so, of course, this also means that uh, working for free is illegal unless you have, a, I guess, an internship. They have different ways to kind of hide behind that. But that means... Um, that kind of makes it very difficult for people who are trying to create that job skills, uh, especially when it's difficult when you, when you can't get hired. Um, a lot of this stuff affects um, the youth and the minorities, and we'll go into some of the details of that. Yeah. But for the most part, I guess I, if you're going to talk about the minimum wage and people who advocate for that, you know, why not you raise the minimum wage even higher than ten dollars and ten cents, right? Right. Yeah. I mean, uh, you could you could uh, point out and say, well, why not twenty dollars, twenty five dollars, uh, even you uh, what you might call left wing left-wing economists would say that's not a good idea for a number of reasons. Yeah, up the ante a little bit. So mm -hmm. if someone says $10.10, well, why not uh, $15? Like, don't you care about the poor, right? Don't you care about the working class? <laughs> why not $20? $20 is a good way, you know, they're making a lot of money, right? Possibly you're wrong, yeah. Yeah, what, what, can't, what can't go wrong? It's like, well, why not uh, $50, $100 an hour? It's like, oh my God, can you imagine what you can do with $100 an hour? Wow. Well, what you can do with seven twenty-five? dollars you give it <laughs> <laughs> right uh, and a lot of people who make these claims of course are not people who are entrepreneurs themselves they're not uh the people who best know how to allocate resources or business managers they're the politicians these are people who have no job skills their job skills are just pretty much dictating your life and ruling your life and telling what you can and cannot do that's not really a job uh you know they're not uh they're not out there uh satisfying the consumer or, or providing goods and services that the, that there's a market demand for um they just sit in their office all day and just write up uh their opinions and on what they think arbitrarily how you should live your life and, and that's how they conduct themselves in the matter in, in the business place. Um, so who do, does the minimum wage law benefits? No, oh, well, first of all, it benefits a lot of politicians who can just say they want to raise it and then get votes of uh, uh, people who feel like they would benefit from that. Uh, it benefits in many ways uh, big corporations because then their uh, smaller competitors have their costs raised immediately. They can't uh, compete. Yeah. 
they've, uh, and in many of the ways, like that's why they lobby the government to uh, to make to pass legislation that affects only the the small company competitors. And you'll find in like pretty much every piece of legislation that in the very back, when you flip it over, all these uh, congressmen have their exceptions, except for this corporation, right? Yeah. So they so these laws are allowed to have their exceptions for a lot of the corporations that backs and um, finances many of their campaigns. What I'd also say is a very uh, important. Uh, thing that the minimum wage does in terms of benefiting people is it benefits uh, people who uh, might not necessarily think that they benefit from a minimum wage increase, but they do. And that would be uh, just your average person who might come from a slightly wealthier family uh, in the terms of, well, they can get a, a better education uh, than the public school system can offer, mm -hmm. uh, which isn't very difficult to do. Uh, and then immediately they can look somewhat more attractive to employers. And then even so, someone who couldn't afford to have those privileges uh has a more difficult time getting work than someone who who could and likely didn't need it as much. Right, and then you can uh, go back to uh, I guess uh, the word I'm coining here, status privilege, and as people hark on the on the state and the government for those particular privileges. There's no such thing as a uh, probably a topic for another discussion another time. I guess I would like to go in detail what is uh, this thing going around called white privilege, right, you know, right. able privilege, and all this sort of stuff. But really, what exists is uh, status privilege, and um, that's what it is. You know, let's go back to the cause and what's creating this kind of um, imbalance in society not to uh, look at the effects. Um, you know, it's the government that's uh, bigoted, like their cops are pointing out minorities, not uh, not you yourself, the individual, or, or regardless of the color of your skin, right? So the monopoly on uh, on these particular services are bigoted, uh, and we're going to show how bigoted they are in terms of the minimum wage laws right, and how they right. target minorities, too. Um, and of course, uh, economists that kind of put a lot of this information out there have no scientific basis for their for their information. Uh, it's not, uh, you will see over time, and uh, each time that they've increased um, minimum wage, that it's not shown to increase uh, jobs. Uh, actually, it's only done the opposite. Yeah, and you can you can see that too. I mean, most people who work for minimum wage, and you know, people who are subject to the minimum wage are a very small portion of the uh, population, some 4.7% in uh, 2012. More than four point. Yeah, 4.7%, less than 5%. No, and more than half of them are under 25. Right. Uh, so, I mean, how many of them are really the people who are, has everyone dependent on them for their income, you know? Um, but then uh, you see a, a huge mass in unemployment in uh, ages of really 16 to 19 when you're just entering the labor market. And the reason for that is because those people are the least likely to be able to justify being paid that minimum wage. They don't have the skills, experiences built up. Somebody else does. They have this so-called privilege um, ahead of others, having had experiences, having had time to build a resume, having time to accumulate working experience that the minimum wage uh, makes it more difficult for new entries into the, the labor market to have. Yeah, and so you're trying to find out why, why it's so difficult to find jobs these days. Like, well, it's difficult to even get a job because now it's illegal for, for someone to hire you to just, you know, move your arms around and just, you know, press a button on a cashier register, for example, right? That's not very labor intensive, you know, to put things on the shelves, but for the most part, um, I mean, that was a wild number that I didn't really uh, realize myself, but of course, uh, government makes it seem like everyone's living on a minimum wage, and actually it's less than 5% of the population in the United mm -hmm. States that actually earn. Oh, not, not even, it's less than that of hourly paid workers. Uh, that doesn't even count people who may work commission jobs. Yeah, yeah, exactly, yeah. exactly. Uh, so yeah, so it, 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 at the same time, it has this interesting social complex with, um, I guess, employees who want to become employers because you have this uh, political dynamic that's saying that it's your employer that's preventing you from having a livable wage. It's your employer that's telling you that... Uh, uh, you, know, you create this animosity, uh, I guess, atmosphere with the employee and the employer saying, well, you know, why aren't you giving me a livable wage? Well, maybe perhaps if half your income wasn't stolen through taxes, you'd have a lot right. more, you know, to do and invest with that. You could take something like the social security tax, for example, supposedly the employee pays half of that and the employer pays the other half. Yeah. Well, that's just going to be considered a cost as far as the employer is concerned. Yeah. I mean, it's eventually you're going to, the employee, or at least in, in the best case scenario, uh, arguably, uh, the consumer would be the one paying for for that their fifty percent of that that tax. So it is all just a cost, right? I mean, when you turn when you look at it in terms of the employer, I mean, there's a lot of stuff. You know, they're paying you seven dollars and twenty five cents an hour. And you're you're selling a product that maybe is uh, twenty dollars, for example. Uh, seven dollars and twenty five cents goes to you. The rest goes to the upkeep for the rent, for the electricity, for for paying uh, the loans that he's taken out, for he or she's taken out for for the cash register, for um for for the utilities, for for the bills that are kind of accruing costs in that. I mean, there's a lot of cost that goes into uh, starting a business, and so there's uh, when you think like, well, he's, he's keeping the rest. No, the rest kind of goes back into the business if you want to stay afloat. You know, you, you can't really uh, grow your business otherwise. <laughs> so, you know, you always want to look for, uh, I guess, if your terms of um, the way that we regulate ourselves, I would 
sooner invest in a business that invests in itself, you know, has billboards, has ads out there, uh, continues to update their website, uh, creates a new store because that means they're investing in themselves. They're going to be around for a long time. And then that goes back to how uh, larger companies like to see an increase in minimum wage because they're the ones who can afford to, to pay out a little more. They've already got that. Uh, those uh, assets already built up. They've already got you know their expenses pretty much covered. Uh, it's the, the newer entries into the uh, business market that are going to have more difficulty handling that. Right, and that goes back again to uh, some of the distraction of what causes people not to have a livable wage is the uh, the way that the state is set up. I mean, that's the setup. It is the nature of the state, you know. So you're going to find that. Um, but well, if there was no state, there's no one to lobby or to bribe or to uh, to, to uh, I guess to pour a lot of your I guess corporate money and influence into to get that kind of political power to prevent market entry for a lot of people who want to to create jobs, who want to start their own businesses. You know, license and premise, for example, discriminate against the poor, the impoverished from competing. Uh, so a lot of this stuff, like even haircuts, you need a you need to pay uh, like a hundred and twenty dollars, I believe, in Richmond, a little bit more than that, to to cut hair. You know, dead follicles, you know, rising from your head. You know, something something simple as that. Um, so yeah, uh, the statistics is out here that says uh, I guess in the way that discriminates against the youth. We'll start with that. Uh, according to the Bureau of Statistics, the unemployment rate for everyone over the age of sixteen was five point six in two thousand five. Yet unemployment was 7.3% for those aged 16 to 19 years. And for those aged 16 to 17, unemployment was 19.7%. 19, 19 and the 18 to 19 age group, unemployment was 15.8%. So you'll find continually over time, every single time they've implemented these minimum wage laws, uh, that percentage starts to increase in those particular, uh, I guess, um, I guess, uh, group demographics for those ages. And the same thing occurs to, for minorities. Uh, for the youth as well, and the least skills, you know. So the way it discriminates against the minorities, minimum wage laws do affect ethnic minorities more so than than others. And that, uh, so unemployment rate for white teens in the 16 to 17 age group was 17.3 percent in 2005, and the same figures for Hispanic and Black teens were 25 percent and 40.9 percent respectively. So you know, to, to advocate then for minimum wages is to is to advocate bigoted policies that discriminate against other people who are trying to to create a living race, you know, yeah. um, who are trying to make it out there in the market, trying to make it out there in, in this world. Uh, so you can find, I guess, a lot of, if you want to say, very, uh, I guess, racist policies behind that. Um, I mean, it's already stated already that these policies are very bigoted to begin with, you know, so to continue to support that is to, to advocate for discrimination. Um, now, I guess in the same way, like marriage laws discriminate against uh, single people, right? Uh, that they have to pay more still in taxes than less if they were not married. Um, and again, marriage laws, when they first started off, they were to discriminate again, right? <laughs> they, they, the only reason the marriage laws came into existence right. was to prevent white people from marrying black people, That's from right. marrying Hispanics and Latinos and, uh, and so forth. So, you know, if uh, government in a very basis and its foundation is very racist and bigoted and, and discriminates against everyone, um, it only caters to the majority, I guess, in that sense. You know, state is pretty much the majority you get elected. Yeah. <laughs> So yeah, it, uh, at the same time, uh, so you'll find that with, with minimum wage, you can't negotiate uh, to be paid a little lower if you wanted to. You can't, you can't have that competition. Right. If you had someone who uh, was willing to take a job for a certain hourly wage, had a little bit of resume, a little more experience than you did. But you know, you might, you might save the employer a dollar every hour and it's not that difficult of a job. So you know what? Why not? Uh, if you do a good job, well then, hey, you know, you have a reference. You got a, a lot in your resume. You've got experience now. So maybe the next time you can justify that extra dollar. Yeah, 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 and that's what you want to do when you start off. You're like, look, I know this is a, uh, you know, not the, uh, I guess, the job I'm, you know, I've been always dreaming of, you know, but I need to start somewhere, uh, and that's that's what uh, the market entry is for, I guess, in terms of this sort of stuff. I guess for the youth, uh, for people who are the least skilled, to develop those skills, to start off somewhere and knowing how a business works, um, how to create trade, create value, um, you know, in, in terms of that, that, that's what people want, and that's what creates civilization, what, what drives uh, the economy. Uh, well, when you're talking about the minimum wage, value is very important, actually. Um, this is the, uh, <laughs> there was a, a French economist uh, from uh, the early 19th century, Frederick Bastiat, who uh, was uh, rather obstinately said, uh, though somewhat truthfully, you can convince a man that two plus two is four, though if he does not like that, he'll vote as though it did not. Right. Um, <laughs> so, uh, yeah, it, it, you got to figure how, how value is determined in terms of a workplace, in terms of uh, of the utility value, in terms of labor, yeah, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, and, and the way we determine value, whether you know it or not, is uh, something called a concept called uh, marginal utility, where uh, a person has uh, X number of units of a certain object or a certain uh, 
um, resource, uh, even including labor, and uh, how they value each unit is based on how many units they have and uh, how they can satisfy the uh, most necessary uses for that object or uh, utility or or uh, labor or what, whatever it is. Uh, so if you have uh, the, ex the example that's really commonly used in economics, you have five barrels of water, one of them you're going to drink, one of them you're going to uh, use to water your crops, one of them you use to cook your food, one to bathe in, and then one to uh, see if you get hot use for heat relief. Uh, so if, you, if you, for some reason you just trip and spill over the barrel of water that you designated to drink, it doesn't mean you don't drink, you just move everything else up the hierarchy of importance. and. Uh, what that eventually causes is for a person to value each barrel of water only so much they value the least necessary cause or uh, application it has. So each barrel of water is individually valued in a unit that can uh, provide heat relief, uh, which might not be very much in that situation. So the value of the water is uh, uh, somewhat lowered, although it is still necessary to sustain the life of the person who has the water. So when you think about minimum wage job, what you have is people who are cashiering, you have like people who, you know, uh, short order cooks, um, grocery baggers, uh, it, not everybody works jobs like that who works for minimum wage, but that is, that is a lot of it. Uh, and really what that is, is people who, you've got a overwhelming surplus of labor in the market, is anybody uh, within a few days to a week tops of training could perform that job almost as well as anybody else could, uh, more or less. So the marginal utility of each individual worker doing that is extremely low, um, as opposed to a doctor who went to medical school, um, does uh, intensive surgeries, you know, very few people uh, comparatively are able to do that, so their wages are, are much higher. Um, again, government then has occupational licensure requirements that restrict entry, but that's the same thing, reducing the supply of labor in the marketplace, whereas in a minimum wage job, it's very, very high. Uh, so that's how you determine value. And uh, another misconception people have is uh, believing that paper itself, the, the money itself, has inherent value. Uh, the value of the paper, uh, or the money, whatever you want to use for money, um, We'll probably have a good topic discussion on, on what is money. Exactly. Yeah. Um, is linked very much to what, or, or entirely really, to, to what it, it's worth in the uh, actual market. So the history of money really is, uh, and this is all extremely relevant, uh, people would barter with each other, uh, but that was a pain because you had to find someone who wanted what you had and had what you wanted in order for an exchange to happen. Uh, or you could, you could steal it, but we're assuming a moral exchange here. Yeah. Um, voluntary, consensual. voluntary consensual exchange, uh, and, and that was somewhat inefficient. So people were like, "Well, let's let's have money. Let's have something that can represent these goods and services. You can redeem for other goods and services." So you know, uh, eventually, gold was really what people decided they wanted to use. But gold, it's difficult to have the divisibility. Right, it. right. The visibility factor wasn't wasn't there. Uh, it wasn't particularly portable. Um, there's really four criteria for another video that I'll talk about where you have. Uh, uh, for a good currency, um, but anyway, so so you, people wanted to have paper banknotes that would uh, represent the gold. So it was really just easier in terms of the uh, practical usage of the the money to use those paper notes as opposed to the physical gold. Mm -hmm. But the the general concept was still the same thing. You were you weren't trading just the rock, the rock of gold. You weren't trading just the piece of paper. You were trading uh, what the paper represented originally and that was the goods and services so if someone says well hey I'll, I'll cash here for you for you know one hour um, and then you'll do whatever in exchange for you they're probably not gonna exchange you you know dental surgery or uh, a, or a house or um, uh, a car or you know utilities for for X number of labor yeah. hours of that particular um, particular it's a service. transfer right uh, so the, the value of whatever amount of money is associated with that amount of work, that kind of job for that amount of time, is eventually going to become pegged to what that amount of work or labor or uh, uh, service is really worth in the eyes of the marketplace. So even if you raise minimum wage to 10 10 or you raise it to $20 an hour, $50 or $100 an hour, as long as the job itself stays the same, as long as the marginal utility of each worker is still as low as it is, 
uh, the money that's associated with it is just going to drop in value to meet the actual value of the uh, of the work of the labor, and that's going to translate to the actual buying power of the service that you're offering. So even when you talk about raising minimum wage, hypothetically, if that was going to help a person immediately, then it would only do so until people realize, oh, well, this is not the right amount of money for this right. service, you know, and then everything else adjusts for that. Yeah, and so in terms of the uh, the money that's uh, been monopolized, currency, for example, another product, another commodity that uh, you're forced to trade in. You know, we we're talking about uh, living wage, then you know, then you definitely have to end the state because you know you have to end their monopoly in currency. Right? right. It's lost over ninety seven percent of its value. So <laughs> there's no incentive to save, especially for the impoverished. If we're talking about people who are li living below marginal lines. Um, so yeah, that's, uh, that's something that's very important, and we're going to go in brief in uh, very good detail about it. Sometimes you just uh, have to have to realize that people would never, ever. Do you give people things or provide them services for just pieces of paper? So there has to be something underneath it, and what's underneath it is what we'll do for each other and give each other for these pieces of paper. Right. What the pieces of paper really represent, what the gold used to represent. The pieces of paper that continue to depreciate every time you put it in your pocket mm -hmm. or hide underneath your bed mattress. Um, so yeah, again, you know, a common denominator of all these social ills and problems is the state. Um, and so, so what can you do, right? I mean, you look at the... Uh, the way that uh, you know the, the skills that you're provided in going to these uh, 12 years of public indoctrination camps, you know that's you know you have to say ask yourself like, well, do they provide me marketable skills from that? You know, right. you went to 12 years of schooling, right? Uh, 12 years of uh, you know trying to teach you all the skills and knowledge as opposed to put you off, you know, into a good foundation as an adult, you know, to put you out there mm -hmm. into the market. Uh, but of course, that's not. Uh, I guess its purpose is to create uh, dependency on government. That's why they don't teach you marketable skills. <laughs> if they taught you marketable skills for you to become independent, you'd realize you never needed government. Well, then you can go back to the history of public schooling, which yeah. you know, which was never really to educate people. At right. All. So we, yeah, it's a different topic. And we'll though, go that, yeah. back into that too as well. But but but, but then you look at the same thing as uh, still, and even uh, coming out from public schools, you don't have marketable skills. Um, you know, things that are worth of value. You know, yeah. you don't really come out with a, an associate's degree or there, anything like there's that. There's no job that you get where your uh, your uh, duties are going to be a. Uh, Pass a standardized test. Right, I know mm -hmm. very well how to uh, copy lies and uh, uh, and um, I guess that kind of uh, distractions of um, I guess political mismanagement, the parade and circuses, the uh, the lies that they're taught to. I know very well how to copy that and write it on a piece of paper. Now that's not really well of a marketable skill that I would want to hire anyone of, right? Uh, I guess ask them if you know, if, I guess something I guess will be interesting if they ever put in like in the employment sheets, it's like, you know, do you believe taxation is theft? You no, know? well, obviously if you do, it's like, I don't know if I could trust you among my products because most of the uh, theft that's involved in workplace businesses happen to be from employees, right? Um, so I guess, I, ethics involved in the, in the workplace but at the same time you have to l examine what it is that government is providing you to become sustainable to to create a livable wage and they don't they don't teach you how to negotiate they don't teach you how to um i guess the computer skills right when you look at john mccain john mccain doesn't even know how to email um you know if you want to uh to find these job skills you know everything's on the computer now everything's on the internet you know i learned a lot on youtube and i spent uh 10 hours yesterday learning how to do uh css coding you know to updating websites uh have an e-commerce business you know later after this video i'll be working on that again um so you know that's that's what you have to do um you're not going to learn this stuff in, in school in public school settings especially yeah, take some initiative to actually get some uh, experiences that people are going to look at and say yeah i think this is this is worth something you know we can apply this yeah yeah in a remarkable setting yeah, be, be proactive about it. Don't let don't let the, the government stuff get you down. Uh, don't let it, uh, I guess, be that thing in, in which you create excuses and justifications for why you're not uh, being proactive about, about it going out there. I mean, the jobs, there, there are ways to still go out there. You know, just negotiate with the employer, you know, off on the side. Say, look, I'm, I'm here. I'd like to create a better value. I'd like to increase the productivity in this workplace. I understand capitalism. understand profit. understand and that you want to grow your business. And I'd like to help. Um, you know, may not be able to be uh, pay me, I guess, the, the wage I would like, but you need to start somewhere. <laughs> The, if the work I'm providing doesn't even out to the everything that I'm supposed to feel like I receive, every one thing that people, every everything that people think you should have just for working whatever job, yeah, then, you know that's not necessarily gonna work out. Yeah, but I mean you can get there as long as you can, you know, sort of climb the job market, and that's kind of where the minimum wage gets in the way there. Yeah, you have to jump a little higher. Yeah, yeah. So, so understand the plight the employers are undergoing yeah. themselves to. Um, it's not something that I enjoy. You know, they love to increase, they love to hire, they love to pay, it and, and to, to keep you. <laughs> yeah. um, but unfortunately, that's not what minimum wage laws does. You know, the actual real uh, value of the minimum wage that you receive is zero dollars, uh, and that's that's what happens to those who are affected by this. Um, so yeah. So with that. Hopefully you guys enjoyed this uh, discussion on minimum wage. My name is Kyle Maloney. Matt Badalioli. And see you guys at the Victory Party. Take good care.